Hey, what's up guys? Pablo Munoz here and welcome to another video series. The content of these short videos is slightly different. It's more about a walkthrough slash overview or breakdown of a project that I did while I was doing the beta testing program of Adobe 3D Tools. So this image that you can see here on the screen is the project that I'm going to be basically breaking down and, and show you the, the whole process of how I created this using the new tools. And the tools or software that I'm referring to are Adobe 3D Sampler, 3D Painter and 3D Stager. There is an extra one, 3D Designer, but this is not something that I use in this particular project. Now, on top of this software, I also use ZBrush for the entire sculpting and modeling of what you can see here in 3D, but the rest was 100% created with the 3D tools of Adobe. So let's go ahead and get started with the first part of this series, which is all about sculpting in ZBrush before we move into the Adobe 3D. All right, so the first stage for me in ZBrush was to create a, an armature of C spheres. And this is a pretty straightforward process, something that I use, especially when I want to create something a bit more complex in terms of the of the shape. So in this case, it was pretty simple, but you know, using C spheres was a, a pretty safe way to just create a base mesh that I can use to um, to tweak and to alter the the volumes a little bit to create the the skin core or or lizard. And at this point, I work with symmetry and I limit my tools in ZBrush to, let's say, the Gizmo 3D and the masking brushes, as well as the move brushes to basically adjust the, the volumes. Because what you get from the C-spheres is a pretty good base, but you still need to tweak the volumes in order to uh, make them look like, the, like this lizard or this skink. So a lot of the time of this initial state is basically using the move brush and tweaking volumes and moving the points at a very low resolution. As you can see, the, the base that you get from the C-sphere is pretty low. And this is what I would refer to as the blocking of the scene. I'm not really worrying about things too much. just want to have some bases, some, some volumes that I can start playing around with. So once I had a bit of the volume, I move into the subdivision approach and I use the Siri measure in ZBrush, which is an automated tool to reconstruct or rebuild the topology that we had before from the C-spheres. And I use some of the selection tools to isolate portions of the mesh like the legs, and that allows me to create different polygroups. And when I run the Siri measure, the difference between the polygroups will maintain a clean loop around. So this is especially useful around the legs or the difference between the legs and the body of this creature. Again, this is more of the same, just adjusting volumes and trying to concentrate on the silhouette and the, and the overall shape of this creature. So all I wanted to do with the Siri measure was to create a cleaner topology to, to start working and to start subdividing this mesh and add some details. So as you can see, it's still pretty basic. It's just moving points with the move brush, adding a little bit of volume with the standard brush and a lot of the masking and smooth brushes just to maintain the, the clean shape of this creature, but at the same time, uh, making sure that everything is consistent in terms of the of the quality of the surface of the mesh. At this point, I went ahead and subdivided the mesh a few times just so that I can start adding a bit more details and, and refine what I would call the secondary forms or, or a bit of the volumes. So you see me using the clay brushes and the smooth brushes just to maintain you know, the, the same level of quality at least or, or polish all across the surface, but adding a little bit of volume. So this becomes a very repetitive process where I add volume with a clay brush and then I go ahead and, and polish the surface or I maintain it a smooth surface with a smooth brush. And because now I have a few levels of subdivision, it is a lot easier to smooth out the surface with the Smooth Strong, which is a brush that comes with ZBrush. So you can just load that up from the Lightbox. Now, another tool that I use at this point is the Dam Standard Brush. And this is a fantastic brush that allows you to kind of like cut through the model. It's like my butter knife, um, or if you're familiar with traditional sculpting, for example, that's the, the equivalent. So I use this brush to sort of cut through the model and create these crevices. Um, not that this creature has too many crevices, but for areas like the mouth and um, a bit of the folds of the skin around the legs, that's where I use this brush the most. But even at this stage, when I'm starting to create more uh, feature pieces on this creature, I still go with the move brush and try to adjust uh, a few pieces. And things like the, the fingers and stuff like that, they need a lot of work. But uh, at this point, I'm just concentrating on, on the overall shapes. And I will come back to the fingers with uh, maybe with the infinite brush just to add a bit more of volume and, and that sort of thing. But for things like the back, kind of like to emphasize a bit of the, the spine <laughs> in a way, I use the standard brush uh, to create a little bit of volume and then the smooth stronger to maintain, like I said, that sort of very, very smooth surface. 
And of course, one of the advantages of using the subdivision approach is that you can go back and forth between you know, the low subdivision level and the highest subdivision level to either add details or, or move larger areas and make large proportional changes in the lowest subdivision level. Now, the wrinkles on this type of creature are pretty subtle. I just wanted to exaggerate a little bit more uh, just because then uh, when I started this project, I realized that I wanted to test a few more things in the Adobe 3D tools. So I exaggerated again. I'm not going for 100% realism in this. I know that the, <laughs> the wrinkles on this skink on this uh, specific type of lizard uh, is not necessarily the same as you can, as you can see here, but um, I just wanted to exaggerate things a little bit and just to stylize it a little bit. So for these wrinkles and the volumes of those wrinkles, I used the standard brush, and then I did another pass with the damp standard brush in between the wrinkles just to, like I said, exaggerate and, and emphasize those, um, those wrinkles or those folds of the skin. I also added a couple of uh, tiny wrinkles, like more of a detailed wrinkle that this won't be as visible later on, but I just wanted to try out uh, one of my custom brushes to add um, details and to add wrinkles. So I use that to add a little bit of roughness in between the, the big folds, uh, just to create a variation in the roughness. And again, the rest is more about tweaking the, the, the main volumes. It's uh, using and reusing the same tools that I just mentioned before. Obviously, the more time that you spend on a specific area, the, the probably the better that is going to look like. So I rushed this process a little bit because I wanted to get into the Adobe 3D tools because that's what I was going to test out. So the sculpting side of things is not great. <laughs> it's not, uh, I wouldn't say uh, fully polished, but it's enough to, uh, you know, to test the tools and then get the, the concept that I wanted. Now for the little bug, um, I use a bunch of references that um, I, I believe they're called tree hoppers or something like that. And it's just a, a very interesting insect that has the shape of a, of a thorn. So I use that as a reference, but again, I wasn't going 100% for the, the shape of a particular, um, a particular bug or a particular insect. So I, I used a bunch of different references and kind of like created my own um, insect. So what you see me doing here is exactly the same thing that I did with the, with the skink or the, or the lizard. It's just blocking out the whole shape. So it's not perfect by any means, like the legs are just like, <laughs> like the extrusion using the Sculptris Pro or Dynamesh and then using the Siri Mesher again to uh, simplify the geometry a little bit. Now, one thing that I should mention here is that the way that I use the Siri Mesher is pretty much the same way that I would use something like the Dynamesh or Sculptris Pro in ZBrush. And what I mean by that is that for me, it's not the end of the process. I don't have to wait and then use the Siri measure to finalize, let's say, the, the topology, and that's it. I move on into the subdivision approach. The way that I see the Siri measure is a fantastic automated tool to clean the mesh and to uh, generate a more consistent base for the mesh and a nicer topology, and that simplifies and, and helps with the rest of the process. But if at some point I decide that you know things are not looking the way that I wanted to, I can just redynamesh that and then later on do another remesher. So it's a very, very organic organic process. And if you compare what I did with the skink and the other creature and the bug itself, there's really no difference. It's just a different shape, but the rest in terms of the process is exactly the same. Just setting it up, blocking out the, the main volumes, the primary forms, and you know, using the same tools like the move brush, the standard brush, the damp standard brush to sort of cut through the model and that sort of thing. And once again, when I moved into the subdivision approach using the Siri measure to essentially simplify the base and create the retopology, and then obviously subdivide the mesh to add details, the process is exactly the same thing. It's just going through, it's going through the motions. It's almost like inertia for me. I have a very basic set of tools that I use in ZBrush to get me to this point. And, you know, keeping it simple allows me to also concentrate on what's important, like the, the main shapes and the, and the overall feel of the sculpt. And this is where I put most of the, of the effort during my sculpting in figuring out how the overall uh, sculpt and the overall um, creatures that I'm creating are going to be read. And something to keep in mind is that all this setup and all this sculpting uh, was meant to be something quick to, to be able to move into the Adobe tools and continue the work there. So a lot of the surface noise and the details that you will see in the final image, they're not from ZBrush, right? The, the ZBrush sculpt and the, um, let's say the, the baking when we get to that in another video, it's, um, it's pretty clean and the surface are pretty smooth. So I use the, the materials that I created in Sampler and obviously uh, 3D Painter 
to define where the finer details and the and the surface noise were, were going to be applied and how it was going to be applied. So a lot of the sculpting here is uh, for the most part pretty clean and all the crevices and all the details that, or not details, but the tertiary shape that you can see on the on the box, for example, that are done with the damp standard brush are just indications of, you know, falls and um, not necessarily surface noise in a way. It's just a, a way to add more visual interest, but the rest is going to be done in the Adobe 3D tools. Now, I realized that I was trying to be a little bit too pretentious trying to make up nature and the leg wasn't really working um, functionally and design was 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 <laughs> pretty poor. So I decided to um, recreate the legs for the for the bug. And I use the same process that I use for the skink or, or lizard creature uh, of setting the bases with the C spheres, creating a base and then a retopology. So this leg works a little bit better. It has, uh, you know, functionally, it, it looks a little bit better. It's still uh, a made up leg for a creature, but it has uh, more functionality and you know, it's something that if you see it in a creature like this, you think, okay, this might work or this this might be something that I can believe it could exist. So it has that um, believability factor in it. And of course, because it was slightly different than the previous one, I just went ahead and placed them, duplicated them, uh, you know, to create the six legs and then adjusted the, the rest of the body to it. But again, more of the same, just clay brushes, uh, smooth brushes to maintain the, the nice clean surface. Uh, because I knew I was going to add the details or the finer details later on uh, as a material. And, you know, to finalize this, this whole setup, I duplicated or mirrored the, the three legs from one side to the other just to complete the, the basis of that leg. Um, and the rest is pretty much doing the same treatment that I did to the, to the rest of the head or to the rest of the body of this bug, uh, which is just refining some of the volumes and making it look a little bit more organic. Now, speaking of organic, I decided to use the standard brush and the damp standard brush to add some ridges and let's call it veins <laughs> because for a lack of a better word, around the, the body, especially at the bottom of the, of the body of this uh, little bug. And of course, just to make it a little bit more of an alien creature, I added a couple of variations of the legs, uh, let's say for the mouth, like some kind of fangs that this creature can actually use, like a predator type of thing. So that was another uh, custom addition to the design. Uh, again, just moving away from the realism of this real creature, this real bug. Now, and to wrap up this sculpting part, I use some custom brushes that are also available online in case you're interested to add some details in into the surface of the mesh. And I use the layers in Seaverge because they allow me to uh, control a little bit the influence of those details. So for example, I use uh, one of the brushes for uh, for pores um, not that this creature has pores, but it will create the, the surface details that I'm looking for and, and those very uh, precise points that uh, make it look very, very interesting. So I apply this effect very loosely. And what's great about this process is that you can add one layer per each one of the, let's say, different effects or different details that you want to add. And at the end, you can just fine tune the influence of all the layers before you merge them if you want to. So you have a lot of control about which specific details, depending on in which layer you added, um, which specific details are showing more or less. And at the end, you end up with a very intricate and interesting pattern that is created with the use of a bunch of different layers, each layer contributing to the, you know, to the displacement and the change of the surface in a different way. Now to set up the scene and pose these these creatures together, uh, I needed kind of like a base, so I just used a cylinder, and that's gonna be the base of the branch or the or the wrapped up leaf that you will see or that you saw in the final version. Now for this base, uh, and I'm gonna call it just the branch, although it has leaves, I used the Gizmo 3D and the gear icon to give it the initial shape. So I use the taper deformer so that it has that nice taper from the bottom to the top. And then with some of the selection tools, I selected parts or portions of this um, branch or this uh, tube, and I extracted those using the extraction tool in Zebrush. And in the settings, I just set it up so it doesn't have any thickness. So I end up with pretty much a, a single-sided mesh for all those three or four leaves that are sort of wrapped around the, the stem or the or the branch. And of course, just to simplify the mesh, pretty much doing the same thing that I did with the other uh, pieces of this scene, the creatures, um, I ran the series measure and simplify the geometry. And this is a pretty simple uh, mesh anyway, so it shouldn't take too long. 
Then I merge everything together, and because I had different meshes, I can maintain different polygroups or different IDs, and that allows me to use something like the move topological brush that respects the continuity of the topology, and do little tweaks here and there just to make it feel more organic, like less manufactured. And to complete the effect, I just added some thickness to the leaves, and that's done with the dynamics of division. The latest version of Zero has a fantastic new feature called thickness within the dynamics of division that creates a preview or a dynamic preview of the thickness that you're going to apply. So you can change how much thickness you want in a, in a single-sided mesh before you apply it. But of course, uh, I I didn't spend too much time in here. I applied those and I copied the entire branch and brought it into my tool uh, where I have the rest of the pieces like the skink and the bug. Now, in terms of the posing, I started with the branch because again, that's the base and I'm gonna try to feed the rest of the scene or the rest of the assets around that branch. And I use the deformers in Sivers again from the Gizmo 3D, uh, which are phenomenal for this type of thing, especially the bend curve, uh, which is the one that I use for um, giving this curvature to the, to the branch because it allows you to add as many points or influence points as you want, and you can move them independently, you can rotate them, squish them. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility for this type of simple meshes. So I love this deformer to, to set up something like this, and you can see just by bending it a little bit and give it a bit of curvature, it does feel a lot more organic, like more, more of a nature shot, which is what I was going for. And in order to pose the rest of the assets over the, the branch, um, I just went ahead and used one of the C plugins that come with ZBrush called the Transpose Master. So this plugin basically merges everything together and allows you to manipulate and move a single piece from the multiple subtools that you had. If you want to know more about the process of posing characters and creatures in ZBrush, there is another tutorial that I've done and I'm going to link in the description so that you can check that out. Now, because the lizard or the skink creature has a relatively similar shape to the branch, I use exactly the same deformer. So I use the bend curve deformer to add some points. And that, as you can see, makes it a lot easier to generate this very, uh, you know, very curvy pose for the character. And then the rest is just a matter of using the selection tools as well as the masking tools to uh, rotate and move things around. And obviously the transpose master uh, brings in the lowest subdivision level. So that's another reason I went through the process of simplifying the mesh and use the subdivision approach because when you move into this process or the posing in general, it's a lot easier to manipulate smaller quantities and smaller um, amounts of polygons or points to uh, create an, a nice looking pose. And then, you know, once you finish, you move everything back to the, the high subdivision level and adjust anything that needs to be adjusted. And you can create new polygroups in this stage that are not necessarily going to affect the original polygroups that you have in the original file. So the polygroups that I created here, let's say for the hands uh, and the legs of the skin creature, they are simply so that I can pose things a little bit easier. But when I go back to the working file, these are not necessarily going to be there. So creating polygroups is just a fantastic and probably the best way of having control over, over certain areas and to mask things um, a lot easier and a lot faster. Now, in terms of the posing, it's not just about masking and moving pieces. With every single thing that you move or rotate around, there's gonna be some kind of distortion. So once I had the base set up, I just went ahead with the move topological and adjusted a little bit of the, of the volumes just to try to simulate a bit more of the weight of the character on top of the branch. Um, so yes, yeah, sort of like, spreading the, the volume a little bit so that there is some kind of gravity affecting the, the flesh and, the, and the, the rest of the volumes. Now, I originally intended for the bug to be um, kind of like in a position where the skin is about to eat it, <laughs> and I was going to place the bug in somewhere else in the branch, but uh, because I worked in symmetry and kind of like in the center of the world, uh, when I was doing the posing, I just realized that it would be cool to have the bug kind of like riding the, the creature and just sitting on top of the head so that you know the whole scene the whole idea change just in this bit um you know and i just mentioned this because it's another um another part of the organic process of designing directly in 3d so you might have an idea or you might have a uh an expected outcome but there are little things and little mistakes that sometimes happens that you can sort of capitalize on and create something um, slightly more <laughs> original, I suppose. So this is uh, this is why I decided to just place that um, that bug on top of the of this of the creature.
Once I was happy with the pose, uh, I went back with the C plugin and click on the Transpose Master again to bring that final pose or final changes to the working file with all the subdivision levels. And obviously, because I set up the pose in this uh, low resolution or the lowest subdivision level, uh, when I bring back everything to the highest subdivision level in the working tool, there are some volumes and some areas that need to be tweaked. So that's what I did in, the, in this sort of like next stage or next uh, step of the process. So all meshes or pieces that made up the scene feel, um, feel unified or feel part of the same. And to wrap up this video, I also decided that I wanted to try out um, how the 3D Stager tool would handle things like fiber mesh and, um, you know, increase the, the amount of subdivisions and, and polygons a little bit. So I just added some fiber mesh for um, kind of like the fibers of the legs of the, of the bug. Uh, but that's pretty much it. So hopefully you have found this video useful. Again, this is the first part of the series, just concentrating on the sculpting side of things. And I just wanted to give you an idea of how I got to the point um, of having the meshes and the high-res mesh and all of that before we get into baking and creating materials and that sort of thing. And that's for the next video. So I'm gonna wrap this one up here and I'll see you in the next stage of the process. Cheers.